The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. All these voices. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Staring into the Abyss. I am your host, horror author James Hershey Jr., and with me, as always, my co-host, old boy James Ash. How you doing, brother? I'm doing pretty good. How is everybody tonight? I am beyond stoked for tonight's show. For those of you that have been with us on this journey for quite a long time, we've been at this for years now, you will know that every once in a while, I like to do a history show. I like to take a badass or a crazy person from history and just give you a ton of information about that person, tell you the stories, and just really get into that person's mind a little bit with you. Uh, we do really, really good history shows, but we don't do them very often because there's a ton of work that goes into these things. Tonight's is going to be a hell of a lot of fun. Because tonight we're going to be talking about one of the most badass mountain men that you've never heard of. I mean, almost nobody's ever heard of this guy, but this guy was fascinating. So, to start off, the dude's name, what he went by was Liver Eating Johnson, if that tells you anything. His actual name uh, was John Jeremiah Garrison Johnston. He was born uh, July 1st, 1824, and he died January 21st, 1900. So he lived to be an old man. And as I said before, he was a mountain man. Now, I'm not going to get into like every little detail of this dude's life. Because I, I think the important parts here are some of these crazy, crazy stories about him. And they actually did an interview with him when he was older. And... He pretty much admitted to all these stories being true. The only thing he said was not true was the fact that he never actually ate the livers of any of these people. But a lot of people say he did. So, let's start not really at the beginning, but let's start earlier on in the story. He was in the army during the Mexican-American War. Um, he actually served aboard a ship, and he enlisted in the army, like a lot of people did at those times, under like a false age. He wasn't actually the age that he claimed to be. He was, he was younger. But they did that back then because they wanted to go fight, and they wouldn't let you in if you were too young, so a lot of people lied about their age. Here's an interesting side note that I always found very fascinating, and maybe we'll do a show on this some other time as well, but... During those times and, and earlier times, a lot of women would actually go and fight as well, but they weren't allowed to fight. So what they would do is they would pretend to be men. They would dress as men. They would tuck their hat up under. They would try to talk a little deeper. And a lot of times they would take like uh, linen or some sort of cloth material and they would wrap their breast so that they would kind of squeeze them in so you couldn't really tell that they were a woman. And they would pretend to be men and go fight fascinating stuff i'd like to do a show on that at some point too because there's a lot of really cool stories that go along with that but today is live reading johnson and this is this is really cool so this dude went into the military under a false age and basically he had a kind of a rough time of it in the military a lot of times your commanding officers are not very nice to you they will kind of cuss you they will scream at you they're jerks a lot of times they do that to kind of break you down, and that way you can be built back up the way they want you to be built back up, so that everything you do is almost like muscle memory to keep you alive. But old Liver Eaton Johnson 
didn't appreciate that too much. He didn't like getting yelled at all the time. So one time his commanding officer was yelling at him, and he had had enough, and he stepped out of line, and he walked up and he decked a dude and knocked him on his ass. Um, that ended up getting him kicked out of the military. He got a dishonorable discharge, and at that time period, that was not something that you wanted to have. That was a big deal to get discharged dishonorably from the army. He didn't want to have that stigma of being somebody that had gotten a dishonorable discharge. So he decided he was going to move away and he was going to change his name. So as I said in the beginning, his name was actually John Jeremiah Garrison Johnston. So what he decided to do was go by the last name Johnson instead of the last name that he was using he was going by John Garrison when he was in the military so he decided I'm gonna go by Johnston instead so that's what he did he went out and he went west he started out trying to find gold like a lot of people did at that time he ended up in Montana well at that time it was the Montana territory it wasn't really Montana yet and he tried digging for gold he had a little bit of success, but not much, but he ended up becoming what is called a wood hawk. And what that was, was he would go and he would cut wood and he would supply it to the steamboats because they would use a lot of wood and coal to operate the burners to create the steam to move the ship. And he would also sell lumber to the Spanish and the French when they would come down through. And he was doing all right doing that. He was making a decent amount of money. Uh, he was a really big guy. He was 6'2" and about 260 so for that time period he was very very large and he, according to all the reports he had almost no body fat he was a really muscular big guy he wasn't fat now there are tons and tons and tons of legends about this dude he ended up meeting and falling in love with a native american woman who was a member of the Flathead American Indian tribe. Uh, he asked for her hand, it was granted, and they got married. They fell in love, got married, and he decided he wanted to build a cabin out in the mountains, so that's what he did. And they had a wonderful life there. Among the things he did, besides trying to find gold and selling lumber, selling lumber was his main thing that he was doing, but he also got into trapping. He would like run trap lines and the thing about running trap lines in the wilderness is you do them for a long time it's a long line of traps that are set up and what you do is you have to walk that entire line and check all your traps if any of them are triggered you have to reset them if you have anything in it you have to take it out and reset the trap and you keep moving all the way down the line now when you do that you set multiple different trap lines so when you go out checking your trap lines you might be gone for anywhere from a couple days to a week to even sometimes a month. And he, he had so many trap lines set up that when he would leave to go check them, it was usually about a month trip to do it all and then come back home. So he's out checking his trap lines and there was a Crow Indian attack on his cabin when his wife was there. And it did not go well for her at all she ended up being killed and the crow indians actually cut up her body and left pieces of her all over the cabin and they left the main piece of her right there on the doorstep for him to find her so he gets done with his trap lines and he comes home and sees what's left of his wife in the doorway dead uh, blood everywhere pieces of her strewn throughout the cabin now, as I said, he was deeply and madly in love with this woman. This was his everything. And something just kind of kind of snapped inside of his mind. He vowed while he was standing there, looking at the remains of his, his love of his life, really, his wife. He vowed that he would have revenge on the Crow Indians. So where the liver-eating Johnson part comes in is the Crow Indians believe that in order for you to go on in the afterlife, 
you have got to have your liver. You've got to have all your pieces and you've got to have your liver. It's very important to proceed in the afterlife according to their legends. So knowing this, he decided that the ultimate revenge wouldn't just be killing these people. He thought, what I'll do is I will kill them and then I will cut out their liver. So they can't even have a life in the afterlife. They're just going to be stuck wandering here and they're not going to be able to move on to the next life. Now the legend states that he decided that eating the liver would be the best way to ensure that they could never get the liver back. So they're definitely never going on to the next life because he has now consumed their liver. It doesn't even exist anymore. He ate it. That's why supposedly he ate the liver according to legends. Now, as I said, in an interview later on, he claimed that he never actually ate any of the livers. He said he cut them out, but he never actually ate them. But that may or may not be true. We, we honestly don't know. So what he did was he went out and he started hunting the Crow Indians. Whenever he would find them, he would kill them all. Everyone he could find, he killed. And he would cut out their livers and eat them, according to the legends. He killed and scalped, according to multiple reports, more than 300 Crow Indians. And then ate their livers as a way to avenge his wife's death. Now, as you can imagine, after killing more than 300 of these Indians, he kind of got a, a very large reputation and a large collection of scalps as well, because he would scalp them all. He was almost like the boogeyman at that point to them. They would tell stories about him and there would be warnings to young braves when they would leave to go out hunting or to go out and do something. Hey, watch out because liver eating Johnson might be out there. You know what I mean? He was really living rent free in their heads. He was the boogeyman to these people. Now I'm going to tell you another story here that kind of goes along with this. That was not done by the Crow Indians, but it was done by the Blackfeet Indians. According to this legend, they wandered up onto a camp the Blackfeet Indians did. And at this camp, they saw a man, a very large man, sleeping. So they snuck in and they kind of jumped on him and tied him up. That man was liver eating Johnson. So they tie him up and they take him with them, throw him on the back of a horse and take him. They take his guns, they take his horse, they take everything so that he has nothing anymore but the clothes he's wearing. They put him inside of a teepee and they station one young brave just to kind of watch over him while the rest of the hunting party or the raiding party or whatever goes out to try to find more people to kidnap and kill and all that kind of stuff that they did. So he is left behind at this camp with one brave watching him in the teepee. Now the brave doesn't think he has anything to worry about because the dude is tied up. So hour after hour goes by, the, the young brave is kind of sitting in front of the teepee just waiting for everybody to get back and making sure nothing happens. At some point, Johnson was able to kind of work his way out of the ropes that he was tied up in and get free. Now, he had no guns, he had no knife, he had nothing anymore. They had taken everything. So he kind of snuck up behind this young brave. And he attacked him from behind and beat him severely. He then took the brave's knife and scalped him with it. And then cut his throat. After the young brave was dead, the legend states that Johnson used that knife to saw off the brave's leg. So he kills him, he scalps him, and he cuts off one of his legs. Johnson then takes that leg 
and takes off running through the woods with it. The reason he took off running was because he knew that it was only a matter of time before the rest of the Blackfoot Indian come back. And when they came back, they were not going to be happy because he was free now and he had killed the brave that they left there to watch him. So he takes off running through the woods trying to get away. He has no horse. He has no guns. He has no way to hunt. He doesn't have any supplies that he can set traps with. So if he wants to trap, he'd have to kind of make the setup himself from stuff that he could find in the woods. But he wasn't really going to trap either because he was trying to get away. So his main priority was putting a lot of distance between himself and this camp because he knew that all the Indians had horses and they would find him and kill him. So he takes off through the woods with his leg that he cut off the other guy. And he's kind of hiding and he's moving at night and he's hiding out when he has to and kind of playing hide and seek with these guys and, and trying to make his way back to his cabin up in the mountains. Which is a fair distance away because he had been out hunting Crow Indians for quite a while. So he wasn't even really close to where he lived. So this took multiple days to get back. During that time period, he was eating the leg that he had cut off this Indian in order to stay alive, to, to give himself energy and all that kind of stuff. I don't know whether he was cooking it or whether he was just eating it raw. There's no real information on that that I could find. I will tell you, though, if somebody is chasing you and trying to kill you and you are trying to evade, one of the things they teach you in the military and they teach you in school is you don't want to have a fire. Because if you have a big fire in order to cook something, you're going to draw attention. They're going to be able to see the smoke. Now, you're not going to be able to see the smoke as much at night. But the problem with having a fire at night is there's a glow of the fire in the dark and you'll be able to see it. Now, one way around this is an old Indian technique that what they would do is they would make a fire hole. They would dig down a hole and they would build their fire inside that hole. And then they would have a little shaft going off of that hole into another hole that would provide the airflow in order for the fire to burn. So if you build your fire that way down in the ground, so that none of the flames are really coming up over ground level. And you do it at night, you eliminate the glow and you don't have the visible smoke at night. And you could cook that way if you really needed to. And then all you have to do is kind of knock the dirt back over the hole and the fire's out and you can move on. So that is one possibility of what he could have done if he had really wanted to have a fire in the night and cook. I personally highly doubt that he even took the time to set up a camp. I think he was just kind of running and trying to get away and making distance. And when he had to sleep, he would kind of curl up in some bushes somewhere where he was well hidden and just crash out and then wake up and roll again. I don't think that he was setting up an actual camp, digging holes, building fires, all that kind of stuff, because there's just way too big of a risk of being spotted and, and being captured again. That's my own personal opinion. That's not based on anything from the legend. The legend doesn't state whether or not he made camp or cooked or anything like that. So he may have been eating that leg raw, is my point, as he was traveling. So eventually, he is able to make his way all the way back to civilization, back to his cabin, and lived through the whole thing. So that is one other that was just absolutely amazing. And you wonder, is it true? You know what I mean? I mean, cause this guy, according to the legend, he escaped into the woods. Like I said, he ate that leg while he was on the run. And the place that he ended up getting to 
was the cabin of a guy named Del Gu, who was his trapping partner. And that dude lived over about 200 miles away from where he was captured. So that means that he traveled 200 miles on foot with the Blackfoot Indians chasing him. That's pretty amazing. Now, according to several different people, this is a true story. This actually happened. There's really nothing in there that is, I wouldn't say that it's unbelievable. The main part of it is the eating the leg thing. But if he's eating livers, I don't think he would have a problem eating a leg. Now, another variation of this legend states that, that he was out hunting Crow Indians and he ended up traveling over 500 miles during winter time to sell whiskey to the family of his wife. And while he was on the way to sell that whiskey, he was ambushed by Blackfoot warriors. That is another version of that. And in that version of the legend, the Blackfeet knew who he was and they, when they captured him. And their idea was they were going to sell him to the Crow Indians because he was the guy that was hunting the Crow Indians down and killing them and eating their livers. So they thought they could get a really good price for him if they turned him over. And that is the other version. The rest of it's the same. He was stripped down. All the stuff was taken away. He was put in the teepee with one guard. Um, he got out of the straps. He knocked the guy out, took his knife, scalped him, and then cut off one of his legs. That whole thing is exactly the same. At the end of that legend, he gets to his trapping partner's cabin. In the other version of the legend, he gets back to his own cabin. Which one is true? Who really knows? It seems to make sense that he could have been running whiskey to his wife's family. That seems like it would be a believable thing. So it could be that that version is true. But those are the two main versions of that legend. Supposedly it has been backed up by multiple people that it actually happened. So that's pretty damn cool. Now eventually, and this is going to be an absolutely unbelievable thing, but eventually Johnson actually made peace with the Crow Indians. And he even considered them his brothers, if you can believe that. Now, this didn't take place until like 25 years later. And after he had killed just who knows how many Crow warriors and scalped them and ate their livers. It was a hell of a lot of people that he killed. Uh, but 25 years later, he actually made peace with them and he considered them his brothers is what it says. So that's pretty amazing. Now, this wasn't the end of the tale of Liv Reed and Johnson. He actually went back into the army under the name Johnston. And he joined uh, Company H, which is the 2nd Colorado Cavalry of the Union Army in St. Louis in 1864. Uh, he joined as a private. And the next year, he received an honorable discharge. Uh, during the 1880s, he became the deputy sheriff in Colson, Montana, and then the town marshal in Red Lodge, Montana, which was pretty amazing. Now, the, the government records about him, his military records and everything, say that he was five foot 11 and three quarter inches tall. The legends state he was six two. I would probably go with the military records. I think that those are probably more accurate. And the legends probably just made him bigger than he was. Because that's what tends to happen with a lot of these legends. Is they kind of get exaggerated and stretched to where the person becomes larger than life. Uh, with Live Reading Johnson, I don't think that there was really any reason that you had to make him larger than life. Because hell, he already was. I mean, this dude killed who knows how many Crow Indians. And he scalped them and cut out their livers and ate them. Uh, he was captured by Blackfoot. He escaped, cut off the dude's leg, and ate it as he traveled over 200 miles 
evading capture again to get to his trapping partner's cabin. He was a sheriff. He was a deputy sheriff. Unbelievable. I mean, he even, at one point, he even built log cabins for a living. I mean, this guy did all kinds of, of really cool stuff. He eventually made his way all the way out to Santa Monica, California. That's where he ended up living at the end of his life. And he lived in a veteran's home there in Santa Monica. Uh, he was there for about a month before he died on January 21st, 1900. Uh, he is buried in a Los Angeles veteran's cemetery originally. Uh, but after a six month campaign that was led by some seventh grade students and their teacher, they actually exhumed his body and they relocated the body to Cody, Wyoming. And that's where he's buried now. They did that in uh, 1974, uh, June of 1974. So that is the tale and the story of John Jeremiah Garrison Johnston who was known as Live Reading Johnson. This is one of my absolute favorite mountain man tales. And the cool thing about this is it's all true. You know, this isn't one of those things where it's like you're talking about some lumberjack who had a blue ox named Babe and lassoed a tornado and all that kind of stuff. This was a real guy. This actually happened. He, he fell in love and got married. His wife was murdered by a crow raiding party and he took revenge in a unbelievably brutal fashion. I mean, this all happened. And as I said in earlier, he was interviewed about this later on in his life. And he confirmed that yes, all of this stuff was true. Uh, as I said, the only thing that he said wasn't true about all of the legends was that he never actually ate any of the livers. He was very okay with allowing them to believe he was eating the livers because it, it put fear in their hearts and, and really freaked him out. But he claimed he never actually did it. Now, whether that is actually true or whether he was just trying to soften the story a little bit so he didn't look like such a monster... Because remember, at that time, he had gotten into politics and all that kind of stuff. So possibly he was just trying to make it not look so bad. But it could be that it was just part of the legend as well. I'll leave that up to you to decide. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to throw over to Old Boy and get his opinions on the legends and what he thinks about it all and anything else that he would like to talk about. So Old Boy, go ahead, brother. Thank you, brother. Um Okay, so everybody knows this. <laughs> I've never heard this story before. He told me about it yesterday. It was really awesome. So I said, hey, let's do it. Um, my opinions on it? I believe the guy exists. That's true. Um, I believe maybe what happened with the Indian, he got captured. Then he escaped and killed the Indian by cu and cutting his leg off and surviving on it. That's a possibility. The problem is 200 miles in uh, multiple days on foot by yourself. He did have a knife, so remember that. He stole the knife and cut the leg off. That, that, that would be one hell of a sharp knife to cut bone with. So the problem I have with that, it would take a while. It wouldn't like he killed somebody and he just cut his leg off. He would have to sit there and cut through the phone, bone. So it matters what kind of knife this was. Well, maybe it was very sharp. We don't know. But that would take some time. And uh, But they, he could have got an axe and cut it off. That, that would, or a tomahawk. That would make more sense. Because it would take time with the knife. If you think about it, if you're trying to escape, you're going to sit there for... 10 minutes cutting off somebody's leg. I, I I have a opinion on that part right there. I don't say it didn't happen. It probably could. Have, but I don't know if he used a knife. It might have been a bone knife, though. So you never know what kind of knife it is. But if he got it, I do believe he probably just ate it raw. But he might have cooked it. Because also, think about it. It would have went bad eventually. It, it, it's still meat. It's still going to rot. So he might have cooked it. 
maybe he got something from the Brave that was watching him. We don't know. Um, it's not impossible. Um, I believe he probably did it because I know he, that the story is true, you know, with him, with his wife. You know, I'll be honest with you guys. If somebody did that to my wife, I would flip. I would probably do something like that and get revenge. You know, I mean, that's somebody you love. I mean, that's your best friend. That's your, who you're meant to be. Anybody, a lot of people would snap if that happened. If you they snuck in your house while you were, you know, trapping, and they cut your wife up into little pieces and purposely leave it there, you're going to get revenge. I, I don't care who you are. Now, the whole military thing, that sounds true. I totally believe that. I've known somebody who's done that. Got kicked out of the military because he punched the sergeant. That happens a lot. That's not the first time. That's no joke. I believe that 100%. The whole eating the liver thing, he even said he didn't do it. That's probably something that got exaggerated, like all stories do. Um, multiple sources, I believe that he did a lot of the stuff he uh, was being said. But you also can remember a lot of people exaggerate. So that could be, there's a big possibility on that. But it, this guy sounds like a badass dude. Um, I wouldn't want to mess with him, especially he's pretty big, you know. And if they caught him, and then he still escaped, and he ran, ran around with a, a a human being's leg, eating on it. I believe that probably happened, but I don't know. But I was thinking about how would he be able to do that if he's get, I mean, unless that's a really sharp knife, like super sharp that cuts bone. He might have had a something else because I'm not going to sit there and hack a, a leg for 10-15 minutes and just in while you're trying to escape so he must have used something else and maybe you, you know it doesn't explain that so it's not a big deal I don't say it didn't happen because multiple sources say it happened I just don't think he used a knife I think maybe he got a tomahawk because if he had a teepee that he had a guard there it was heavily armed so he didn't just have a knife so there's probably a possibility the guy had a gun too so that's probably just being left out of the story. And I believe he probably made it because back then you, you could, you know, if it's in the woods, you could, you know, if you know what you're doing, like James Hershey, he can survive with just a knife. So that's not impossible. He probably knew how to drink certain waters. He found stuff to, you know, sleep in. You, you can find certain trees. A lot of people don't really, especially if you're in pine, if you can you have the right stuff you can get pine and lay on pine needles and it keeps you warm and keeps you from getting wet i do know a little bit not like james hershey he's a he's a surviving man you know and you guys can see some of the stuff he does on uh, the channel and he has in the past but he probably knew how to survive especially you know being in the woods being a trapper so he knew what he was doing he knew how to hide from the crow indians and he knew how to escape because he's like I said, he's probably done this, you know, hunting them all the time. He probably, you know, had to hit hide from them or hide wait till they went to sleep to do something to him. So he knew uh, how to do it, but he was a cat game, uh, basically a cat game. You can't just go out and start cooking in the middle of the day. So if he did do it, he might have done it that way. There's other ways to keep a fire down. Oh, you can you can put a bunch of rocks around. It keeps the glow off, especially he found somewhere inside a cave or something at night, or he could have still cooked something. It's not impossible, especially if it was during the day. Then there's no gonna, there's only going to be smoke. You're not going to see light that, uh, during the day. So he might have done it then. I'm just making – that's just my opinion. But this sounds like a really badass dude. I mean, this guy <laughs> – you know, especially in politics, you get into politics, you got to make yourself look better. So he probably changed a lot and probably said he didn't eat people's livers. And he probably did. Because if that's something that's disrespecting somebody's belief and you want to disrespect them, that's the way to do it. And that would make a lot of sense. It's kind of gruesome, guys. I mean, this guy sounds like he's a cannibal. It's it, it, like it's not just he did it for reasons this guy had no problem eating somebody's leg and he and he supposedly eats people's livers and he probably did other this so honestly this guy sounds like a <laughs> a psychopathic killer and he was doing that i mean if you think about it i mean i don't i understand why because he 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 somebody killed his wife but he already had issues already with his anger he, you know he punched his sergeant you know, he had issues already. So it's not like it just he put him over the edge. And he already had it in him to do this. Some people just need something to snap you into it. 
Um, and that's what did it. And I don't blame him. I mean, I'd be mad too. Now, him being buddies with him, I don't know. I'm not going to say that's impossible, but I, I think there was more to of that being politics. So he, you know, pretended to because he wanted to get somewhere and that. I don't know. I don't know if you could ever forgive some, uh, people who killed your, your wife and you killed many of them. So I don't think it was always, it was like they were best buddies, but they might have forgiven each other. But you know how people say that and still they have animosity to each other. Anything could set it off. That's kind of weird, though. I, I think that's the biggest, craziest thing they said. But some people do forgive you. Even doesn't matter if some of the worst things that happened to them, they can forgive you. So I'm not going to say it's impossible. I've seen it before. People who've been beaten, um, Family's been killed. They've forgiven people, and they do, and they have, and I've seen it. So it's not impossible. I don't know if I could first give somebody who did that. Uh, I wouldn't go and kill all the Crow Indians, though. It's not all their fault. It was just a certain few. I would have found out who did it, and that's the way I would have done it. If it, and I'm not saying I'm advocating for it. I'm just saying that's, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not in that situation. I'm just saying that that's just the opinion I have. If somebody did something, I would just go after the person that did it. I, I don't ever understand why people take it out on everyone. But, hey, I'm, that's not me. It's not my situation. It's somebody else's life. And it sounds like he had a crazy one. But it sounds like he knows what he was doing. He was hunting, trapping. That's not easy to do. James will tell you that. I know he'll go. he can tell you a little bit about that. That's not an easy way to live. Back then, especially then. It was in a really easy way to live. And you had to be good at it. Because if you didn't, you, you starved and died. and didn't make any money. <laughs> you didn't eat. So this guy knew what he was doing. So I'm not surprised about the survival thing. Like people can, like, especially he had military training. And even though he got kicked out, he still knew what he was doing. So he had some military training and went back to the military. So And, and he was a badass dude, guys. This guy was no joke. There's a lot of them. It's crazy. Some of these people, like Rasputin, that's one we got to do one day. I, just, I Sorry to bring this up, but that dude was crazy. They tried to kill him, poison him, it didn't kill him. There's all kinds of stories about Rasputin. He's, he, was, he was also huge. He was like 6'5", 300 pounds or something. He's huge. And there's other things I don't want to get into, but we'll talk about that one day. Maybe we can do that show. That, that guy was crazy. It was from Russia, I think. You know, we probably could do that show. That guy was another crazy but crazy guy, but he survived all kinds of stuff that happened to him, though. And, and I don't want to get into that because that's going to another story, but it's kind of similar to that. He didn't go around eating people, but he just was a crazy guy. And they tried to kill him numerous times, and they finally did, but it was like crazy way they killed him. It took him forever. It was insane. So maybe we could do a show one day on that one. I just gave another idea. But this guy just sounds like the ultimate mountain man, man, eating people's leg. <laughs> he also escaping because, you know, they tied him up pretty well. He, he, he did it pretty well. He escaped the uh, Crow Indians. They're really good trackers, man. I mean, they know how to catch you. They knew they weren't stupid either. They were really they want to find you. They could. I'm surprised he got away, but he must have been a really good trapper to run away from all these all these Crow Indians that were chasing him. That's crazy. I'm just thinking about it in my head because I didn't really know the story, guys. Like, I only knew a little bit about it. And then listening to the story, I'm just like you. I'm like, man, that, that's, that's some crazy stuff. It's hard to take in at one sitting. But I'm not surprised. You know, I've heard crazier. But that's pretty one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. And I hope you guys enjoy it. Let us know what you think. Leave in the comments. Tell us what you think. You think it's exaggerated? You like it? You think it's under-exaggerated? You think it's just uh, uh, urban story? Let me, or urban tell, sorry. Tell me what you guys think. Leave a message in the comments in, in when we put the show out. So that's it, James. I don't have much to say. I didn't know too much about this guy, but now I do, and it's awesome. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. For me, the... The best part of this story is imagining the, the mental state of this man. Now, 
in his early life, there's evidence he was a hothead. So he's not exactly a calm and rational kind of guy. He's, he's a dude that'll whoop your ass if, if you get in his face. He's one of those kind of dudes. He's an intense alpha male kind of guy. And to think how soft he must have been inside when it came to his woman. Because he loved this woman so much. And then to come home and to find her in pieces like that. Imagine the the mental breakdown that must have happened there. I mean, I am a, a nice and loving person. But I am also a very dangerous person. I have extensive training in multiple different uh, martial arts. I have military training. I have a lot of training. I can be a very dangerous person if I want to. I also love my wife very, very much. She is my soulmate and my best friend. If I came home and I found that scene, I can't honestly tell you sitting here what I would do. I can tell you that most likely it's not going to end well for whoever the hell did that. And I could, I could very easily put myself in that situation in my mind and, and, and understand that I would absolutely snap in that situation. I can understand why he would seek revenge the way he did. Kill the people that did it. Kill their families. Kill their, everyone they ever knew. Wipe out the entire tribe, if you can. The entire Crow Indian gone. All of it. I can understand that that mentality in that situation. Maybe some people can't, but I can honestly say that if I walked into that scene and that was my woman, let's just say a lot of people are going to be meeting God very, very soon. Because there's no way in hell I would let that slide. Nowadays, people rely on on the courts and the justice system to take care of things like that, usually. Uh, back then, it was a little more freewheeling. Back then, you had a lot of lynch mobs. You had frontier justice. You know, you did have sheriffs and marshals, but it wasn't as organized and, and as trustworthy as it is supposed to be today. Even today, our justice system lets us down in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different cases. But it's a lot better than it used to be. Back then, I mean, you could be an outlaw and just leave the area and go somewhere else and you were fine. You know, you can't do that anymore. If you break the law in one town, you could go all the way to the other side of the country. You're still screwed. They're still going to catch you. Back then, it wasn't like that. You just leave the territory and you were fine. So there was a lot more frontier justice that happened back then. So I think what this was a case of is a guy that was a bona fide badass. And he just lost his his mind, dude. He, he came home to his love of his life cut up in pieces. I mean, what, what would you do? I think he snapped and he decided he was going to kill every single Crow Indian he could find. And that's exactly what he did. Now, I don't know how long this psychotic state lasted. Uh, it said he did it for 25 years before he finally made peace. So that is a very long term psychosis. But I think at some point in that, at least early on, I don't think he was in his right mind at all. So I think when you when you hear this tale about the the Blackfoot Indians grabbing him and tying him up and going to sell him to the crow and he did what he did, I mean, I don't I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility really because I don't think he was in the the right frame of mind. I don't think he was in his right mind at that point. I think he was still crazy as hell then. And I think he was 
really a cross between a wild animal and, and Michael Myers or something. You know what I mean? I think he was a very dangerous individual who no longer had the the conventional morals of society to concern himself with. He really didn't care anymore. He lost the only thing that mattered to him and the only thing he cared about at that point was revenge. He didn't care about the law. He didn't care about right or wrong. He didn't care about innocent or guilty. He only cared about making as many people pay as he could possibly make pay. I think that was his state of mind. And I think that explains why he did what he did. Now, as far as knowing what he was doing in the woods, yes, he absolutely had to in order to be a trapper and a mountain man. The hardest part wasn't starving to death in the woods. Because if you know what you're doing, it's amazing how much food there actually is in the woods. I mean... There is so much between animals and, and wild edibles, so many different insects that you can eat. In a pinch, you can even eat the soft inner bark of trees. You cut those into very thin strips, you boil them up in the water, and it's almost like eating spaghetti. Granted, a little tougher than spaghetti, and, and it doesn't really have any nutritional value, but it'll fill your gut so that you're, you don't feel like you, your belly's trying to eat a hole in your back. So many different things you can eat out there. You know, clover, dandelion. There's so many wild edibles you can eat. Most flowers are edible. Pine needles, you can chew on those. You can make tea out of them. That gives you a, a real good boost of vitamin C. There's a lot that you can survive on if you know what you're doing in the mountains. So dying of hunger wasn't the issue. The main problem that mountain men had, there was two main problems. Well, let's say three. Let's go ahead and say three because the other one I'm going to throw in is an obvious one. And it's not really an external force. It's kind of with everybody at all times. And that is disease. Main problem, your health. If, if you get sick and you're out there in the mountains by yourself, you're kind of screwed. There's a lot of different remedies that you can do with plants, but something really bad you're going to die. Uh, mechanical injury is really bad when you're out in the wilderness. If you can't move around, you're going to die. A, a simple cut can become infected and kill you. You don't have access to medical care. So that's one. Uh, the other one, main one, was the Indians. We have this idea that the Indians were these innocent people that were peaceful and loving and and we came and just slaughtered them that's not the truth that's not how it went they were vicious vicious warriors i mean they were some of the baddest warriors you could imagine man they would go to war with each other all the time they took slaves they ate each other they they had cannibalism that went on between tribes they would kill each other all the time they attacked innocent people that were settlers that were just trying to make a living, they would go to their homesteads and raid them and attack them and murder them and burn the place and all kinds of terrible stuff. So they weren't Boy Scouts. These were serious, serious warriors. And that was the main thing that a mountain man had to worry about, is coming across one of these raiding parties and getting killed. The other thing you had to worry about out there was predators. You have grizzly bears when you're out west you are on the menu for a grizzly bear he will absolutely eat you most other bears will kill you if they need to but it's not their first choice a brown bear usually will just run away unless it's with its cubs a black bear it's a 50 50 shot sometimes it'll kill you sometimes it'll leave you alone a grizzly bear you're on the menu it looks at you as food one thing you do in the woods when you're walking around is make a lot of noise. The reason you do that is so bears know you're there and they go away. They don't want to run into you because you're loud and you're a pain in the ass. So they will stay away from you. They'll keep their distance. That's one way to ensure safety and also to make sure that you don't put yourself in the most dangerous situation you can be in with a bear, which is walking up on a bear when it has its cubs. I've done that. I was out hunting and I walked around a cliff face and walked right up on a mama bear and her two cubs. 
and she reared back on her hind legs and let out a blood curdling roar and about made me have a heart attack right there. It scared the hell out of me. Now they tell you what you're supposed to do in a bear attack is lay down on the ground, cover your head with your hands and your, and your arms the best you can and just let the bear maul you a little bit and it'll go away. That's conventional wisdom on it. I have never subscribed to that theory. It may work, it may not, I don't know. I'm not gonna lay there and be a chew toy, screw that. I turned around and ran. The problem is a bear can run way, way faster than you. I mean, bears can reach around 30, 35 miles an hour, so they're gonna catch you if you run. They can also climb trees like nobody's business. They run up a tree like it's not even there. So there's really no way to escape if one wants to come after you. But what I did was instinct, I just turned and ran. Now what saved me was I slipped on some loose rocks and rolled down a hill into a, a bunch of thorn bushes and the bear kind of followed me a little bit, stopped and went back to its cubs. It didn't want to mess with me all the way down the hill and in the thorn bushes. Uh, it was a pain in the ass getting out of there. It was, it was a whole ordeal. But that's the main thing that you want to avoid in the woods is walking up on a mother bear when she's got her cubs. That's why you make a lot of noise. You say, hey bear, hey bear, like that as you're walking, you can sing to yourself, whatever you want to do, just to make noise to alert the bears that you are in the area and they'll leave you alone. But the other main predator is the mountain lion or the cougar. That is not going to be scared away by you making noise because you are a prey item and it will want to eat you. Now the problem with cougars is you don't know they're there until it's too late. Once you know the cougar's there, you're already dead. You just don't know it yet. Because what a cougar will do will ambush you from above. It'll either be up in a tree or it likes to walk up on, on like rocks and stuff that's above you and it'll jump down on your back as you're walking and it'll put its claws into your shoulders and like chest and it will grab the side of your neck with its mouth and just rip you to hell. So it doesn't last long. Once it's on your back, you've got a couple seconds until you're dead. So once you know something's happening, it's already too late to do anything about it. That's the problem with cougars. And if you make noise, the cougar is going to know where you are and it's going to find you and it's going to kill you if it wants to. Nothing really stopping it. Now, one thing they tell you to do is to wear a pack, right? If you have a backpack or something like that, that you're taking with you hiking, if you have that pack on your back, that will, will buy you a, an extra second or two because it makes it harder for the cougar to get a hold of you and to kind of get its claws sunk in correctly to anchor itself so it can bite. It will give you not much time, but maybe another second, second and a half. That might be the difference between getting your knife out and stabbing this thing in the face and dying. Chances are you're still screwed, but it gives you a little bit better chance. Those were the dangers that a man like Liver Eating Johnson would have had to face out in the mountains. Nowadays, it's dangerous. Back then, there was a hell of a lot more cougars, a hell of a lot more grizzlies, and there were also packs of wolves that were going around, and they will eat you too. So there was a lot of predators that he had to worry about, killing him and making him dinner. So he had to know his way around the woods, he had to know how to hide, he had to know how to defend himself, he had to be very, very competent to be going out there and doing what he was doing. So the fact that he was able to maneuver his way through the woods is no surprise to me. The thing about a couple days was the one version of that legend. In the other version where he traveled over 200 miles to his partner's, his trapping partner's cabin, in that version it said it took him weeks to get there. So that makes sense to me, that that, that could be done if you're motivated in a couple weeks you could you could travel distance you know what i mean if you needed to because you also got to think there's rivers that go through there and if he gets in the river and he can make some major time you know it doesn't take long to, to slap a few trees together and make yourself a crude raft and float down the river and make some serious distance so to me all of that makes sense i hope that you guys enjoyed this episode uh we are almost out of time so i'm gonna throw over to old boy again for his final shout outs and then we'll wrap up Thank you, guys. I hope you enjoyed this show. Um, thank you for joining us every Sunday night at 9 Pacific Time, 12 Eastern on Parax Radio. If you guys want to hear the show and other shows from 
our past and other sh different stuff we do all together, go to James Hersey's YouTube page and subscribe. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying. It's April 1st, a uh, new month. Uh, it's spring now. I hope you guys are all enjoying it. Um, you guys want any uh, merchandise? I'll tell you where to go. Shirts, COVID masks, all kinds of cool stuff. Just so you guys know, in a couple weeks... We are going to be in a magazine, and we'll let you guys know probably next week what the magazine is. I'm just going to give you guys a, a sneak peek. We're going to be in a, a little article, but it's in a really popular magazine. It just came out a couple months ago, but we're going to be in it. So I hope you guys uh, check us out soon on that magazine. I'll tell you the magazine next week. I'm just giving you guys a little sneak peek so you guys on a cliffhanger for next week. A little one. I hope you all have a good night. Misfits, sugar ladies, monster hunters, and demon lovers. I love you and blessed be and have a great night. Bye. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash James Hershey Jr. That's where everything is. You got every episode of Staring. You've got every episode of Tales from the Abyss, the TV show we do. We got paranormal news videos. You got all kinds of cool stuff there. 100% free. Please go subscribe. Enjoy it. The merchandise store is teespring.com slash stores slash staring into the abyss. That's T E S P R I N G dot com slash store with an S on the end slash staring into the abyss. That's where all the merch is. There's multiple designs. There's shirts, hoodies, mugs, posters, pillows, blankets, etc. All kinds of cool stuff. Really good prices, really good quality. If you want merch, that's where you can go to get it. Thank you guys for supporting us. Thank you for hanging out with us again this week. And I hope that you enjoyed this show. Let me know down in the comments when I put this on YouTube what y'all thought. As always, we love you and we will catch you on the next one. Until we speak to you again, love many, trust few, and do harm to none. God loves you and so do we. Bye-bye.